Hello, and welcome to another in our series of the great chapters in the Bible. Our chapter today comes from the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 37, The Dreams of Joseph. Beginning in verse 1, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being seventeen years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was a son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream. And behold, he told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying in mind. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And a man asked him, what are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we'll see what has become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore. And they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be held upon him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent a robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. 
Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Irma Bombeck once quipped, When you are asked if you have a favorite child, apparently you are expected to choose one of your own. From time to time, I ask people, sometimes complete strangers who are talking about their family, if they have a favorite child or a favorite grandchild. I always, without exception, get the same answer. No, I love them all the same. Yeah, right. Come on, you know you like one better than the rest. Now, I always knew I was my mother's favorite child. She never actually said so, but I knew by the way she treated me that I was the apple of her eye. My daughters have a running feud as to which one is my favorite. Well, I'd like to, once and for all, clear it up and tell them and you which one really is my favorite. But you'll have to wait until the end of this lesson to find out. Some background first about our chapter. It has been perhaps 14 years or so since Jacob, or Israel, left Paddan Aram and Laban's rule. Jacob makes peace with Esau. Rachel has died giving birth to Benjamin on the way. His sons murder an entire town because one man defiled their sister, Dinah. His father, Isaac, passes away. Jacob is now dwelling in Canaan. Jacob has made a rather bad mistake, one that is understandable and actually quite common. He has a favorite child. Why? Because he was a child born in his old age. I say it's not unusual because many a parent chooses a child for the same reason, because they are the last child born, or at least one of the last. The problem isn't because he has a favorite child, but rather because the other children know he has a favorite child. He shows it by giving him a coat or robe of many colors. Joseph really has the deck stacked against him, so to speak. He is the favorite. He has the robe to prove it, and he snitches on his brothers for a transgression that isn't revealed, but it is significant. If that weren't bad enough, Joseph then has two dreams that further irritates his ten brothers. Remember, Benjamin is younger than him. Either Joseph is rather naive, or he just doesn't care that he is his father's favorite. His dreams are easily interpreted, and his brothers and father perceive that they are the ones who will bow down to this young whippersnapper. His brothers not only hated him, but were jealous of him as well. So much so that when he journeys to check up on them, they hatch a plan to kill him and bury him in a pit. What they attempt to do is to tempt fate. We will see what will become of his dreams. Keep reading there in Genesis 37. It's all there. Every sordid detail, all the dirty laundry of that flawed family. Murderers, deceivers, schemers, and liars. Every turn just seems to dig them deeper and deeper into their own pit. Then, to top it all off, they torture their poor father with a lie and let him believe his favorite child is dead. Verse 35 is so sad to read. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol, or the grave, to my son, mourning. Thus his father wept for him. As bad as this is for Joseph at this point, it's about to get even worse. Taken from his family, his homeland, and sold into slavery in Egypt, where he will languish as a servant and then in prison. You have to do some math based upon other passages, but Joseph will be in Egypt for about 20 years or so before laying eyes on his brothers again, and longer yet before he sees his father. That's a lot of time for bitterness and anger to build up inside. That's a lot of time for guilt and regret to settle in to his brothers, who now have to live with what they have done. Day after day, they no doubt watched their father wither over their brother, his son. Can you put yourself in the place of Jacob, or the ten brothers, or Joseph? Maybe we have made those mistakes of showing favoritism. 
Maybe we have been the victim of being bullied because our parents showed us favoritism. Maybe we have treated others harshly over jealousy. You'll no doubt read ahead or have already read the account of what happens over the next two decades. It is an epic saga and one that isn't resolved in a 60-minute TV show where everyone lives happily ever after with a minimum amount of suffering. I cannot help but muse when I read the end of this story after Jacob has died in Genesis chapter 50. Beginning in verse 17, we read, Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of your servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when he spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant it evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. How does Joseph do it? How does he figure it all out? How does he overcome those feelings he must have had locked in prison all those years away from his father, all those years of freedom that is lost? Maybe you and I have had some experiences that have challenged us to overcome such things. Perhaps not to this extent, but one that made us want to take matters in our own hands. If so, it will do us well to search and to find where Joseph got his strength from to put the past behind him. After all, isn't that a better path than the path of bitterness? Oh, and just so you know, if this passage has taught me anything, it's that I love all my children and grandchildren equally. Sorry, kids. You'll just have to live with that. Love your dad. And Lord willing, let's meet here again tomorrow and look at another great chapter in the Bible.